and, and I could go out to Kenya once I'd saved up the money by working as a waitress in a hotel just around the corner there. And fortunately heard about and then met Dr. Lewis Leakey and he was impressed by how much I knew. And I was really lucky. One, he felt that maybe women might be more patient in the field. And, you know, I think he probably is right in, a, in that during evolution, our main job has been to raise children and to be a good mother, you have to be patient. So that's possibly, he was right, but he also wanted someone who hadn't been to university because at the time, the, the, the ethologists studying animal behavior were very reductionist. And I was actually told when I finally got to Cambridge that uh, there was a difference between us and the rest of the animals, a difference of kind, not just degree. We were separate, we were isolated on a pinnacle. And then there was this unbridgeable chasm and then all the other animals. And David Greybeard is the one chimpanzee who helped me to show science. It was not an unbridgeable chasm. I like to think of us reaching out, him from the animal side and me from the human side and meeting in the middle. Well, how about we see the video after talking all, all about this? So can we play the video? Jane, how, how long did it take to get to a position where David and Goliath trusted you so you could get close enough to observe that? Well, to get, to get really close to David, Goliath, and all the rest, it was, actually, it was over a year before some of them trusted me. It was very long, and this tool using observation, as I say, I still wasn't really close, and that was after four months. So David and Goliath then began coming to my camp. There was an oil tree in oil palm tree in fruit. David came and then stole some bananas. And then <laughs> I asked my cook to go on putting out bananas. I was still up in the hills. And David began regularly coming and then Goliath followed him. And then William followed the two of them. Then gradually, well, the real breakthrough came when the old female Flo, she had begun coming to camp for bananas. And when she became sexually attractive, all the males came. They, the, the attraction of this sex bomb Flo was greater than their fear of me and the, and the camp. So that was the turning point. <laughs> uh, well, you know, whatever works, whatever it takes, whatever right? <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I think another subtle point is that you just rattled off a bunch of names, right? David, Goliath, Flo. Uh, wasn't it against the sort of biology best practices to humanize and name uh, your subjects? Well, I didn't think giving a name is humanizing. <laughs> and a lot of the chimpanzees didn't have human names. There was Figan and <laughs> all sorts of other names. But anyway, um, I didn't know that. <clears throat> Remember, I hadn't been to college. So yes, when I got to Cambridge, many of these professors, and I was really in awe of them, because, you know, I was thrown straight into a PhD program. Leakey said there was no time for an undergraduate degree. And to be told I'd done everything wrong, chimps should have numbers, not names, and I couldn't talk about personality, mind, or emotion because those were unique to us. But fortunately, even though I was scared of them, um, I had this wonderful teacher when I was a child who taught me 
that they were wrong in this respect, that we're not the only beings on the planet with personality, mind, and emotion. And that was my dog, Rusty. Here he is. He's always with me too, along with my mother, by the way. And it was she who supported my dreams as a child when everybody else laughed at me and said, you'll never get to Africa. You're a woman and you don't have money. And she said, if you really want this enough, you'll have to work awfully hard, take advantage of every opportunity. And if you don't give up, maybe you'll find a way. So she's, she's responsible for me being who I am. All right. Uh, Sean, I think we have another video to play now. Um, so, so, you know, so now you, you see them using the tools, w what happens next? Do you rush back to camp? I mean, what's the sequence of events here? Well, I saw, I think I saw the tool using in the morning. No, I didn't rush back to camp. What was the point? I went on observing. I mean, every single day I got up into the mountains before light and I didn't get back to camp until almost pitch dark every day. And right at the beginning, uh, I was told, or Leakey was told by the, because back then it wasn't Tanzania, it was Tanganyika and it was part of the crumbling British empire, one of the last outposts actually. And the authorities said they wouldn't allow me to go on my own. I had to go with someone. And so mom volunteered. So she was there right at the beginning. But by the time I saw this tool using, her four months was up. And the authorities had decided, well, I was slightly crazy, but probably okay. And so um, she volunteered to come. So she was there right from the beginning. I would have gone back earlier to tell her this exciting observation, but she wasn't there, she'd gone. It was just two weeks after she left, actually. It was a bit sad, really. I think we were programmed to want to share exciting things it's just part of who 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 we are as people wanting to share now you say that uh, people in africa they had known all about this all the time but you know for us us the western uh people we thought this was a major discovery so what's the lesson there i mean we could have known well, this a long time earlier right yeah, I mean, West, Western science has always been rather arrogant, I think. And, you know, being, I, I mean, Western science taught me or tried to teach me that you couldn't have any empathy with your subject. You had to be coldly objective. And that is absolute rubbish. It's nonsense. And, you know, you can... You can be feeling all the empathy that you that you are capable of. I remember watching a little three-year-old, and she just three month sorry three month old baby, and she happened to be named Jane, which didn't make any difference. But you know she was <laughs> called Jane, and she got a broken arm, and so every time she her mother cradled her, she screamed. Well, this was the first mother. She didn't understand. And so she would press tighter and the baby'd scream louder. And I'm watching this and tears streaming down my face. But if you if you look at the notes that I made, then you know, every minute exactly what was happening and what was happening around her. So it's it's rubbish. And I think you should have empathy. And it's this cold blooded lack of empathy that's led to a lot of cruelty, the way animals are treated in labs, for example. You know, and there are still people, mostly those who are not treating animals very well, like in slaughterhouses and things, and they still maintain that animals are just things and were put onto this planet 
for our, us to use as we as we wish. So, yeah. So, I don't think that many Africans knew about tool using, but those who live right out in the rainforest, they'd seen chimpanzees using tools because I met some of them. Uh, I think we have another video. Uh, these these are videos of you reading from your book uh, in the shadow of man. Yeah, but we can't hear, can we? Well, I've been checking behind the scenes and... Cautiously, I moved round so that I could see what he was doing. He was squatting by the red mound of a termite nest. And as I watched, I saw him carefully push a long grass stem down into a hole in the mound. After a moment, he withdrew it and picked something from the end with his mouth. I was too far away to make out what he was eating, but it was obvious that he was actually using a grass stem as a tool. That's good. I could hear that. Yeah, I could hear that too. Well, and arguably that's the most important video, right? I mean... Yeah, that was the one. David Grady yeah. using a stem yeah. as a tool. And it's so so amazing we have that film that Hugo took way back then. Uh, you know, because it does bring everything to life, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no refuting that, right? I, no one can say you imagined it. Uh, no, but do you know that, just, that some scientists honestly, literally said, I must have taught them? I, I, <laughs> it was beyond belief because I couldn't even get close when I first saw it. So to have taught them, what would make me think of teaching them? to fish for termites. I wasn't eating termites, <laughs> no, I mean, really. So, so, I, mean, I mean, basically, I, I don't know if they would have said this, but basically what that shows that, that you were young, female, without academic credentials, basically showing them up. And so the only explanation for that was you cheated, right? Right. <laughs> Oh dear, yes. Well, it was, you know, see, the thing was, nobody had been out in the wild studying chimpanzees. Uh, George Schaller had studied gorillas, and there were two Americans in South Africa studying baboons, and that was it. So I was so lucky. I, was, I got in right at the beginning. So everything I saw was new, everything, not just the tool using, but, you know, their communication gestures, kissing, embracing, holding hands, uh, gradually learning about the long-term bonds between mothers and their family and the brothers and sisters, uh, you know, learning everything that we're still learning 60 years later, still a team there observing the same chimps. We're in the fourth generation now. Uh, let's say there are future Jane Goodalls watching this right now. What, what would you like to tell them? Well, I would like to tell anybody watching who has a dream of some sort, maybe not watching animals in Africa, but whatever it is that you dream, don't give up. And But you must be sure that that's what you want to do. And very young people, you know, their dream often changes. You know, my, my little nephew wanted to be an engine driver, and then he wanted to be something else. But it doesn't matter if you change. As long as when you really find out what it is that you want to do, you, you don't give up, but you will have to work hard and take advantage of opportunities. And you may not get there straight away. I left school and I had to do this wretched secretarial course before I could save up to get to Africa. So. It's never too late. Well, there's an important lesson there in that um, you would think that the, the optimal path for your career was to get a degree in biology, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, uh, it was your secretarial skills that got you into the leaky organization, right? Well, it was, it was that plus I had read every single book about African animals. And I'd spent hours in the Natural History Museum in London. Leakey at the time was curator of the Natural History Museum. 
And I think what really impressed him was the fact that I knew so much. And the amazing thing was that two days before I met him, his secretary had suddenly quit and he needed a secretary. And there I was. I was never a particularly good one, but <laughs> I did know about animals. And now I was surrounded by the people, the staff of the museum, and Leakey himself, who could tell me and you know, answer so many of my questions about the mammals and the birds and the reptiles and the amphibians and the insects and the plants of Africa. All right, we have another video now, so please play video five. On the eighth day of my vigil, David Greybeard arrived again, together with Goliath, and the pair worked there for two hours. I could see much better now. I observed how they scratched open the sealed over passage entrances with a thumb or forefinger. I watched how they bit the ends off their tools when they became bent, or used the other end, or discarded them in favor of new ones. So, uh, it, it, they're really they're, it's completely cognitive right i mean it's completely planning and using tools and everything it's oh, yeah. kind of remarkable yeah yeah and yeah. you know people say well they're not saying it so much now but only we can plan ahead well <laughs> because of our language i think it's true to say only we can plan for the distant future but for the immediate future now here it was uh I, I don't know if it was David Greybeard, but a male chimpanzee by himself and he's resting and then he sits up and he scratches, which is when they're sort of thinking and wondering what to do, this very deliberate scratch. And he got up and he wandered over to a place where there was tall grass stems. He very carefully selected five. He put them in what we call the neck pocket. He put them here. And he went off down a trail to a termite mound that was completely out of sight. So you can't tell me that he wasn't planning when he scratched, I'm going to go and eat termites. I mean, it's, it's obvious they can plan for the immediate future. Um, you know, what, one of the consequences of these videos and your discovery is it's not an untrue statement that you are the woman who redefined man. Well, that's because at the time, <laughs> uh, we would, man, it was man, the tool user, man, the tool maker. That's how we were actually defined. It was Professor Osman Hill, uh, a giant among scientists, never been in the field or anything like that. Um, he hadn't even studied animals, but that was his definition. So that's when... Leakey sent me a telegram after I told him about the tool using, and he said, now we must redefine man, redefine tool, or accept chimpanzees as humans. <laughs> uh, uh, you, you said something just now that just like boggles my mind, which is how are all these biologists who are so-called experts, how could they have never been in the field? I mean, that makes no sense to me. Well, it, it just wasn't happening back then. I was in the forefront of a, of a wave, and I think they were just beginning to go out in the field when World War II began, and it all kind of came to an end. So that budding desire to go out in the field was cut short. But then, you know, gradually it, it, it started up again. So I was just lucky. I mean... I was there at the right time and I met but, the right person and everything fitted in. It was honestly as though it was meant. And you know, there's something else, which is in a way even more amazing. I was with uh, Hugo, we'd married by that time. We were out on the Serengeti Plains. He was making a film about lions and we saw some ostrich eggs. So ostriches lay about 13 eggs at a time but there'd been a fire. So they'd abandoned the nest and there were these eggs. 
And to our utter amazement, there were two Egyptian vultures there. They're very beautiful little vultures, white with black black heads and not much bare neck. Well, no, no bare neck at all. And what were they doing? They were picking up rocks and throwing them on the eggs until they broke the egg. I mean, this is incredible. Nobody had seen it. Nobody had seen it before. And yet they all do it. So I think that people were, you know, so tied up when they did get out there studying my own animal and not really looking around. So. Uh, I, well, uh, pardon my ignorance, but how, how does a vulture pick up a rock to throw it? <laughs> with its beak. Oh. Pick it up with your beak. And so yeah. I, I, you know, we, we tested them. We made some fiberglass eggs and took them to and laid them out on the ground, the size of ostrich eggs. And every time we did that, a vulture would appear and throw rocks at it. So, of course, you know, you can't just, that's cruel. So we always took a hen's <laughs> egg. We found that to, to, to eat a hen's egg, they pick up the egg and throw it on the ground. So that made me think, ah, that's where this tool using came from. So um, I knew somebody with a pet mongoose and a banded mongoose. When they find an egg, a small egg, they stand upright and throw it on the ground. So I thought, mm, let's test them with an ostrich egg. Lo and behold, what did they do? Pick up stones and throw them at hmm. the egg. So you see, that theory was right. Hmm. Speaking of theories, uh, can... can uh... Can animals teach each other? Well, mostly to... it's the, the young ones learn by observing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, teaching is possible, but by and large, they, the young ones, they watch so intently. And then at first, it's very funny when you watch a little one trying to imitate mum, they imitate different parts. So one thing the chimps do when they've been termite fishing for a while, there's lots of little termites crawling about on the surface of the heap. And they do what I call mopping. They put their wrist on the, on the heap and they go like this. And the, the termites stick in the hair and then they eat them off. And so little Flint, when he was about five months old, he mopped everything. He mopped the ground. He mopped his mother's fur. He mopped his own arm. It was just so funny. And then they start using tools when they're a bit older. But they either use um, a long bendy one that doesn't work or sometimes a little tiny short one that doesn't work. And one of them chose a thick stick, pushed it down into the heap really hard and then couldn't get it out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's fascinating to watch the development. And, you know, chimps in West Africa, um, they use... Uh, a, a rock or a very hard um, piece of timber, they put hard shelled nuts on a, a rock or a tree root and crack it open. The, the Gombe chimps don't do that, although the same nuts are there, but they don't eat the kernel, they only eat the flesh. So these traditions, which we now call cultures, and of course, when I first talked about culture, I was poo-pooed. I mean, that was a no-no. You know, I was doing everything. I was just being anthropomorphic. And well, sorry, but they do have cultures because one definition of culture is behavior passed from one generation to the next through observational and learning. That's what they do. So you get different tool using cultures in different parts of Africa and other animals have cultures too. Fantastic. I, I think we have one more video, Jane. One more video. Here we go. My early observations of their primitive tool making abilities convinced a number of scientists that it was necessary to redefine man in a more complex mm -hmm. manner. Or else, as Lewis Leakey put it, we should, by definition, have to accept the chimpanzee as man. I sent telegrams to Lewis Leakey about my exciting new observations, the meat eating and the tool making, and he was, of course, wildly enthusiastic. 
Indeed, I believe that the news was helpful to him in his efforts to find further financial support for my work. It was not long afterwards that he wrote to tell me that the National Geographic Society in the United States had agreed to grant funds for another year's research. What an exciting time. Indeed. Well, we talked what, about that, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, we talked about that. What an exciting time. So, uh, what are you doing now? Can you talk a little bit about the present and the future? Um, what else would you like to communicate to your fans? Well, you know, when, when I was first grounded here in the UK, having been traveling 300 days a year around the planet, raising awareness and developing our youth program, Roots and Shoots, which is now in 68 countries. Uh, I, was, I was frustrated and angry. I'm now stuck here. I can't go out and do these lectures. But then that seemed pointless. So with a, a little team, we created Virtual Jane. And Guy, I have never, ever been as busy in my life. I mean, it's so exhausting. My eyes get really sore. I'm all day long looking at this silly little green camera spot, um, giving lectures and giving a lecture with an auditorium full of, you know, energy and excited people, 5,000, 10,000. That's one thing, you get a feedback. But gazing at this little camera and trying to imagine all the people who are listening, not all together to in sort of egg each other on, but all in their separate little, wherever they are grounded, uh, it's very difficult. And then I'm doing um, hope casts like this and interviews and doing video messages to the different 24 Jane Goodall institutes around the world and the two chimpanzee sanctuaries that we have just to, you know, to give because they're working very hard in very difficult situations and they need to have their morale boosted from time to time. And then, of course, there's all the emails and, you know, I do have a family. I need to make contact <laughs> with them. <laughs> so it, it's just relentless. It, it, it literally, is. You know, there's no weekend. People say have a nice weekend. The only difference is I get a few less emails because other people have weekends, luckily. And so it, the, the days blend to weeks, blend to months. I cannot believe I've been here since March. Yeah. And, you know, as I say, my little tiny sanctum up here under the attic uh, used to be a bit of space, but now it's filled up with microphones and wires. And <laughs> ah. so, but anyway, the benefit, the silver lining to this is that apparently I've reached millions not hundreds of thousands, but millions more people in many more countries in the same, same time. Oh. So that's considering, I think, the message for people to, to get together and come together and make change before it's too late. Okay. Because we are in a mess, Guy, aren't we? The planet is in No, a, we certainly are. Yeah. Well... Maybe after today, we'll be in a little less of a mess, but uh, so. It must be. It's got to be. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I'm just so thrilled to be here with you today. I mean, like I'm in the presence of someone who's changed humanity's view of animals, Jane Goodall. How many people can say that? And I surfed today. What a great day. <laughs> All in one day. <laughs> and, and, and the day's not over. No, okay. oh, goodness knows what might happen. My day is more <laughs> nearly open than yours. Yeah. But I still have I still have two more events today. You do? Yep. Wait, what time is it? It's 10. It's, it's 10. No, in, it's 5, so 5 7. 5 30. Yeah. Then I've got an event at 6 and another one at 9. Oh my goodness. Yep. You, you you need to well so you need to rest. We need to end this. And um 
you know, people who are listening who would like to support your efforts, uh, should they go to the Jane Goodall Institute website? They should, absolutely. And, you know, I'd love people with children or children or students to find out more about Roots and Shoots if they're not already involved, because I can tell you this program, it involves young people choosing projects to make the world better. One for people, one for animals, one for the environment, because it's all interrelated. And it's about getting together, discussing what they care about, and then rolling up their sleeves and taking action. It's all about taking action. And yes. it's the one way so many people right now have lost hope. They're, you know, they, they look at the news, they hear the TV. I mean, they look at the TV, they hear the radio, and it's doom and gloom and doom and gloom. So no wonder people are losing hope. But once you actually take action, once you see that, yes, I can make a difference, I can clear litter with my friends, I can clean up a stream, or I can raise money with my friends to help orphans in some other country, then you begin to feel, wow, well, I'm making a difference here. And I know that there's other groups like mine in other countries doing the same sort of thing. Then you dare think globally. Then you do get a glimmer of hope. So these young people are my greatest reason for hope, actually. Great. Well, let's hope that some people go into National Geographic mode and support your work. And they can do that by going to the Jane Goodall Institute website and without leaving your home, <laughs> you can support the Jane Goodall Institute. That, that would be a very welcome thing. It'll help Jane continue to do her great work all over the world. And truly, in the words of Steve Jobs, dent the universe. So with that, uh, I think we'll wrap up. You want, you want to say goodbye, Jane? Well, if I was there, I'd give you a big hug. But, um, <laughs> I can blow you a kiss. <laughs> I, one Thank last you. message, one last message for everybody listening is to remember that every single day you live, you make some impact on the planet and you get to choose what sort of impact you make. And I think that's a, a message for all of us, you know. No matter, small choices, what you buy, what you eat, where did it come from, how was it made, did it harm the environment, cruelty to animals, cheat because of child slave labor, all these little things. And you make ethical choices in your daily life. That is moving us towards a better world. Don't you agree? I agree. I, I also have to admit, Jane, that whenever I... Um... <laughs> Whenever I do one of these with you, I feel convicted, like I'm not doing enough. <laughs> so, well, we all just have to do what we do, yeah. don't we? Yeah. Mm. yeah, we do. We do absolutely. Then what you? All right, do, Jane. Your show is watched by millions, so you're doing a lot. Uh, I don't know if it's watched by millions, but, but well, we had the world's greatest first guest, Jane Goodall can't get many better than that it's life is good all right jane we'll let you rest so you can okay, get to your bye. next event thank you very much and have more, a great more, weekend more kisses blown